Folks, you gotta tell me, isn't this beautiful? Mega Aquitaine has finally happened and his majesty on the right right here, King Lopa of Aquitaine is now also the king of Italy. Sardinia and Corsica, which de jure is only Sardinia, but let's just ignore that, and Valencia. He is the most powerful and I dare say the most important man of Western Christianity. I am very excited that this actually happened. I'm very excited that this, is, that this actually took place. I gotta tell you, it wasn't guaranteed. He is not the ideal king either, mind you. He is rakish, I believe, and he's a, he also does have lover's pox. And I think he even has another coping mechanism, but I don't know which one that is. Either way, with the inheritance that he has gained from King Gije of Italy when King Gije passed, he actually has also inherited a claim, at least canonically speaking. Mechanically, there's no mechanic behind this, but he has inherited a claim to the Empire of the Romans in the West. I love this. I'm very, very excited to see this played out. I'm very, very excited to see whether the AI can do anything with it and whether we will be supporting it or whether we will sabotage it. Now, as I said, there will be, of course, a lot of, you know, things that we have to take into account now that our realm is this large, now that we are a part of this Mega Aquitaine. But before we talk about this, let's just quickly address two things. First of all, somebody said, hey, wait a minute, is all of Scandinavia Catholic? And the answer to that is a very clear and resounding no. However, and I brought this up very, very quickly in the past, they are slowly but surely turning. Now, I have seen two angles on this. I think most people agree that a Satro going Catholic is most sensible because otherwise, you know, for example, when it comes to tech, they can't actually go beyond tribal for a very, very long time. And with that, we'll just basically be annexed by the Christians or just do nothing at all because they are so far behind on tech. And this is something I personally don't like because Scandinavia in particular in this very period, so in this year is literally when we are talking about the North Sea Empire, right? And right now they have no influence, they have no connection to the mainland, no connection to the Christians at all, and I always thought that this was quite a bit boring. Now in CK2 you have mass uh, conversion, you have proselytization, so for example you could for example send your uh, bishop in there, and then he will try to convert something, you can't do this here. And as a consequence of this, I at the very least want to have a bit of a railroaded experience. This is a mod that is on the workshop, I think it's called Scandinavia Christianizes, and it's really good. Because it doesn't just say you all Christianize now, but instead it will every now and again trigger an, a decision basically that, you know, has a bit of waiting. I took a look at it in the files and that waiting essentially says, hey, for example, if you're coastal, if you rule over Catholic territory, then you are higher, you know, or you have a higher chance to take the decision that then says I will turn Catholic. If you are very Asatra, if you are, for example, very backwater, right? I mean, this is unlucky, but then again, if you look at this in greater detail, you will see that the ruler here isn't actually a Satra. They retook it because that is just how aggressive, of course, the heathens are. The point being, ultimately, that we're looking at a situation where if they're coastal, if they have uh, if they have Catholic uh, counties, like, for example, Schleswig here, they will turn Catholic eventually. This will happen bit by bit by bit and feels fairly, I, I would say, at the very least, organic, uh, as if we were sending in actual priests to convert them. And I've always liked this. I like this approach a lot. We're going to go with that for sure. And I hope that this long term will lead to a bit of a consolidation, maybe even kingdoms in Scandinavia. It will be a very, very big event once the very first kingdoms will form here, I think. And then we might be looking at a situation where they can actually participate in Christian life, which could be interesting, at least more interesting than, than just, you know, kind of sitting here doing nothing because they can't raid us anymore because we're too powerful. Don't worry about it too much, right? So I, I, that is the choice that I've made here. The other thing that I have changed in the files between now and the last episode is that I took a look at the files because I was playing a multiplayer game, you know, it was really fun. We played in Iberia, I played as Ibn Marwan, I conquered most of Iberia because the struggle clashes are just so insanely powerful. And then I noticed something. I noticed that I could invite various characters, you know, in Iberia, of course, to festivities and, well, to an activity, I should say, so that can be a feast or that can be a hunt. And I really enjoyed that. Is it all that impactful? No, of course not. But for roleplay, there's so much value behind this. And then I looked around and I said to myself, wait a minute, why am I not able to do this anywhere outside of the struggle region? In fact, anywhere you know, that isn't involved. So, for example, Malik Said Ibn Zayn could invite Malik Yaya because both of them are involved, but he couldn't invite Leon because King Marquardt is merely an interloper, seeing as he is Franconian rather than one of the Iberian cultures. I looked at the code and I found out that there was a code comment that said you can use this interaction outside of Iberia with a certain perk. This is not new. This is something that exists, for example, right here for... Defensive Measures. Defensive Measures allows you to also purchase truces, which until then is just an Iberia-only decision. And I looked at it, I looked at the code and I saw that there wasn't any perk that actually did it. That, that, straight up, it, it commented, right, hey, this should be done via a perk, and then there was no perk assigned to this. So, 
Um, until they fixed that in vanilla, I said to myself, screw it, I'll do it myself. And I basically assigned the ability to invite others to activities to Flatterer. Meaning that it is very, very likely that Elizabeth will be the first person that, you know, will be able to allow people that are not her vassals or above her to actual festivities at her place. I like this a lot. I think we can build some relationships with this and I would definitely enjoy using that. So don't be surprised if that is something that I will be able to do. I changed files. I did a mod for this. You won't be able to do this by default at the very least because it's just not enabled in the actual files in vanilla. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out, but at this point we are already talking about Aquitaine, so this is on topic for the actual Aquitaine topic, is that there were some people that talked about, okay, would be cool if you found the HRE, but it won't really be possible because the HRE requires East Francia. And this is an interesting and very frustrating topic to me because it already required East Francia in 867 in CK2. So this is not a new thing. This is a thing that was already present in the old game. And that's frustrating because that as a requirement is a historical reality rather than a, necess a necessary uh, uh, truth behind it, right? What I'm talking about is that the reason Otto the Great was crowned Emperor of the Romans in the West on a realistic level wasn't because he was king of the Germans. It was because he had defeated the Magyars at Lechfeld and that battle was so devastating that literally a century of raiding of Christian Europe by the Magyars was upended by then. It was this ability to defend the Christian world and then, with his control of uh, Italy of course, also to defend the Pope. This is why he got the title. He didn't get it. it. It wasn't related to Germany at all. Now, the funny thing about this is that when I started the series, I actually already had written a decision that changes the HRE formation decision. You can see it right here. Restore the Holy Roman Empire. You get the Holy Roman Empire. The Kingdom of Aqu Aquitaine is destroyed because this is the title that plays a role in the series. Any completely controlled kingdoms outside of Italia will become a de jure part of the Holy Roman Empire. What isn't written here, because it's not written in vanilla either, is that all of Francia would become the jure part of the Holy Roman Empire if founded this way. And all you need is now the title Italia. Because the reality of the HRE was that you should be able to defend the Pope. Now it is debatable whether the Pope needs any defending in this playthrough, right? But Basically, the idea of the Roman Empire in the West was to be the shield and sword of the Pope. And that is something that is now carried out via this decision. You don't need to hold Germany, it doesn't actually play a role. And to be fair, Germany also isn't facing the same enemies as in our historical timeline. The heathens have basically been defeated. Uh, Lusatia, very, very powerful, don't get me wrong, but they seem to be blobbing northwards. Uh, let's actually take a look here. Yeah, they're just fighting a tyranny war here, but they are very, very strong, but not going against the Christians. The Magyars never arrived in the Pannonian Basin, meaning the century of raiding that they did historically never took place. Instead, the Magyars actually stayed back here in Kazaria, and they seem to have been ousted by now. Let's actually take a look how their family is doing here. You are the most powerful, and you are the king of Molva, so they are very much still present, but they were never a threat for the Christian world. So, the reasoning for Germany just isn't there. Instead, Good King Lope, if he were to be in that position, could click this button. Um, I've also changed actually the time that this, that the AI checks this decision, because commonly they do it every 10 years, which means that the AI will never take it, because it's just far too long. I just uh, lowered it to uh, every 12 months, so, you know, if he were in the position, which he's not, I can tell you this, he doesn't hold enough land right now, but if he were in the right position, he could just do it. Right, um, this is the background of Aquitaine and the HRE, so technically, if he were to be in that position, look that he has lover's pox, he's rakish and infirm, he could press that button. Will he do that? I don't know. Will we support him? Will we oppose him? I also actually can't tell you, but this is an option. Um, now, why the Roman Empire in the first place? And this is something where we have to go a bit, I think, into the history of, you know, these kingdoms, the Kingdom of Italy in particular. Historically speaking, King Louis II the Younger was the Emperor of the Romans in the West at this time. He was the heir to Charlemagne's empire directly and he was recognized as the Empire, uh, as the Emperor. Now, did people actually respect his authority? Absolutely not. I mean, don't worry about it, right? It, they, they completely ignored him. In this timeline, outside of Aquitaine basically dissolving Carling rule, which was our doing, nobody actually agreed to saying, you know what, let's forget about the Holy Roman Empire, well, the Empire in the West. Instead, they just kept it going in Italy. You can see that they kept their dynasty on the throne, which historically did not happen. Historically, they lost uh, the throne of Italy very, very quickly after the death of King Louis II. And now, all of a sudden, we're looking at a seamless transition between all of these kings to King Lope. 
in my interpretation, Enow has this claim, it, it hasn't really uh, uh, crystallized, it hasn't really manifested, it's not like anybody believes that this guy is the Emperor of the Romans, but the idea, I think, is ever-present in King Lope Matronet as King Gege the Knowledgeable pushed it upon him. Uh, upon him. King Gege knew that King Lope would be his heir, that Aquitaine would unify with the with the Italian realm for at least a few decades, right? Uh, it happened uh, while Vea actually was still alive that King Lope got this uh, inheritance position. So the way I see it is that we're ultimately looking at a situation where I do think, canonically speaking, in this world, everybody looks at King Lope as the potential Western Roman Emperor who sadly just can't enforce it, but who does have a rightful right. And I like this a lot, because when we look at Pope Gregorius V, I mean, he is invincible. Look at this fella, he could definitely hire the Holy Order as well, definitely also hire a bunch of mercenaries. However, he has been infighting with the Vasilia Romayon. There will be a video very, very soon detailing this as well on the second channel, because there is a lot of very interesting, I think, political theory of the medieval age that we can, you know, put into this... Uh, role-playing universe right here, but the idea for me is that Prince Bishop Romanos of Ravenna is basically placed here by the Emperor of Constantinople to say the entirety of Italy belongs to the Orthodox Church by virtue of Prince Bishop Romanos being the actual ruler of this area in terms of a Christian uh, identity. This is a direct and immediate threat to Pope Gregorius V, so what would be better and Pope Gregorius now declaring Vasilisa Constantia obviously isn't the rightful Roman heiress because, I mean, come on, you know, it's literally the same uh, conflict that they had as in uh, real life because she inherited as a woman, which was a big, big gripe of the Western Church, or, well, at the very least, what was utilized as the uh, 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 Kickstarter for the Western Roman Empire under... Uh, uh, the uh, under the Western Christians, and this is something I think that we're seeing canonically here as well. In in my opinion, in my interpretation, I believe the Pope is encouraging King Lope Matrone to go, and you know, try to kickstart, try to restart the Western Roman Empire. So this is the theory behind this. Of course, there's some theological, there's some political theory. Who cares? That is all we need to know for this playthrough right now. Now let's take a look at the actual vassal situation, because this one is very, very important. It's very different from what existed beforehand. Obviously, we know our dear fellas right here, Count Gilles, we know Duke Vea II, we know Prince Archbishop Buslik, we know ourselves, we know Duke Bermudo Vies, and then we know our husband. And that is almost everybody that already was a part of the realm to begin with. Um, here we have Auvergne, who is a huge bene uh, benefactor of this unification, because previously Auvergne was only this strip of land, like this thin strip of land. And all of a sudden he was given what is rightfully his, and even more. Look at how he's holding a land in Wieden now, as well as in, of course, Toulouse. So Auvergne has actually been given a lot of land, and it does open up the question. Why did Auvergne so stubbornly join the war against Provence? Obviously, we had a personal conflict with him, right? We kicked him off the council, basically. We, we worked against him to work in favor of King Lope and ourselves, and he did not enjoy that. I don't think that this, and you can see it right here, I don't think that the clash that we had and that, we'd, that we may have going forward, I don't think that this is something he did out of personal spite. Yes, of course, you know, he is angry at us, minus 26, but at the same time, we're still very, very positive. So I think this was purely political, and we have to keep an eye on him. He might work against us and our family here as vassals, but not against the king at the very least. So we have to take a look whether he does any moves right now. I think we can relax uh, fairly okay. Then we have Toulouse. Toulouse is the last bastion, if I'm not mistaken, of the Jelonis dynasty. Yes, uh, we actually have Pala, who just is a vassal of Toulouse, so that doesn't actually make a difference. Toulouse has their last landholder here in Duke Joslin, and then later in Count Joslin as well, who actually lives over there. Oh, quite interesting. Is he married to her? Oh, yeah. I see how it is. So they are marrying in, making some more land via this. The Jelonis dynasty is difficult. Um, obviously, they have their trouble with the king. They have their trouble with the authority that rules over them now. Uh, I think they are one of the first to potentially make some trouble. You can see it right here. He is in the Liberty faction, as is anyway. Now, if you think a bit further back, then you might remember that King Lope, uh, sorry, that uh, Prince Vea and his father, and, uh, and let's just take a look at this here, King Asna I had a huge, huge issue with the Witch of uh, Toulouse, with Ida of uh, Toulouse, there she is, and she was a Jeloness. We know that this family, ancestors, which is she actually had an affair with her father. And them still being in control here in this realm is, it's worrisome. 
I don't know where they're going to go. I think that since Prince Veya was not a friend of the Jalanist dynasty based on his dislike, you know, of that family because of his father, I think Duchess Elizabeth looks at Duke Joslin as maybe the first and most personal enemy of the realm and of herself and of her family. After all, this fella is also a kinslayer. I don't think that j they have changed their ways. I think they are exactly as disgusting as they previously were. Now that I look at this, he killed... He surely killed Duke Matfrey, right? He surely killed Duke Matfrey as well, yeah. Wow. So obviously this is his sister. No, actually his... Is this his mother? Did he kill his mother? He killed his mother. Wow, okay. Um... Yeah, no, they are, without a doubt, our personal prime enemies. Um, I was thinking about this back and forward, of course, you know, how do we look at them? It's not a generational thing, I don't carry this forward on a meta level, but I think as a person, Elizabeth looks at Duke Joslin and recognizes somebody that is vile and disgusting. Their witchcraft, if they still practice it, is not like our witchcraft. Our witchcraft is local, our witchcraft is inspired by everything that belongs to the people of Vasconia. He is just the witch that legitimately prays to Satan. I think that is a, a fair assumption of Elizabeth. So Auvergne, maybe a structural enemy, maybe an enemy within the realm, but Toulouse is very, very personal. I think going against them makes a lot of sense either way. Then we have Aragon, and this is Queen Mother Denise. She is very, very influential, a very important person. She has also carried forth the banner of the Crusade in Iberia. And... Yeah. <laughs> Would you look at that? Um, she is very, very angry at King Lope Matronet. She is a queen, I think. Obviously, she stems from the... Didn't she stem from the Jeloness? No, she actually did not. Uh, but she is very, very angry. She is uh, pulling a lot of strings and she is trying to make the best for her children out of this situation. And I really like this idea. She now did marry into uh, House Comanche, but yeah, again, I mean, she's too old to actually have any children. This is a religious, sorry, this is a, a not a religious, this is a political marriage to Prince Ladron Matroné, the brother of King Lope, ultimately making it so that even if they hate each other, even if King Lope recognizes that Queen Mother Denise does not enjoy him one bit, they can't go to war. So she is, without a doubt, a political, I think, genius. Uh, she has established herself everywhere throughout Aquitaine, formerly Italy. And she has prepared her inheritance to go to King Clotaire the Fourth. Now this is interesting to me, because while she is very, very hostile to King Lope and may act against, well, would act against him if they didn't have this pact here, which she voluntarily entered. So ultimately, she doesn't want to act against him as much as she hates him. King Lope is a dear, dear friend of King Clotaire the Fourth of Lotharingia. That's his name. This alliance only happened because this marriage between Ladron and Queen Mother Denise, there you can see it, she basically traded not acting against King Lope for King Lope being obliged to aid her son. And this has happened several times. If you remember, King Lope has been called in uh, into Warsaw Lotharingia time and time again. And at the end of the day, what does he gain from it? Nothing really, because Queen Mother Denise will leave these lands for her son. And I thought about this quite a bit. Is it something that we should worry about? I mean... Historically speaking, these lands, sure, they might, you know, belong to the King of Lotharingia, but for these lands, the King of Lotharingia would then simply swear fealty to the King of Aquitaine. Now, this double fealty construct doesn't work in the game, but the way we're going to see this is that we keep Queen Mother Denise, we keep a very close eye on her, much like we keep an eye on Duke Girard IV, because she is an enemy of the realm, not an enemy of us or anything, but she is an enemy of the realm and must be kept under surveillance in that sense. Whenever she dies, Lotharingia will inherit, and then once Lotharingia dies, these lands will actually go independent, so on a meta level, I'm not too worried. They will just return to Aquitaine in time. I think that is basically how we see the double uh, 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 allegiance here, right? When the King of Lotharingia would normally be the uh, vassal of Aquitaine within Aquitaine, it's just since he will die and they will go independent, this will just be, it, it's fine ultimately, right? Unless they do a great move here, I think we can ignore him, but again, it must be pointed out, she is one of the most important characters, I think, to live right now, because she is so influential throughout Europe. She unified the forces of Aquitaine and Lotharingia via her marriage, via her sham marriage, if I may, and then she will give all of her lands to Lotharingia as well. What a woman, what a powerful, powerful woman. Now, speaking of powerful, Aquitaine actually got a lot more powerful by this inheritance, not just because of all these kingdom titles, but because he got all of Catalonia, well, the core Catalonia, I should say, 
With that, for the first time, giving a huge power base to the King of Aquitaine. Previously, he was literally just holding Carcassonne, our, the home of our family, the seat of our family. And now look at this, uh, he holds much, much more land. Again, very, very good for him. Uh, then we got Urgel. He is, interestingly enough, actually a local in this region. The Katalayud dynasty is long-standing in Iberia, and he is quite powerful as well, even if he's only 13 years old. Are this goes? I don't know. I don't think we have any meaningful opinions on him other than, okay, sure, cultural acceptance. But yeah, for us, uh, I think Orgel here and Count Guillaume feel like a world away. We don't really meddle in Iberia. Iberia doesn't really meddle with us. I think that is all I can say. Same, of course, goes for Countess Antoinette of Tarragona. Uh, I don't think we have any strong opinions on either of these. Interestingly enough, we have Duchess Agatha of Valence, so Valencia here. And she is a Carling, however, she will have Louis Tibalte de Comanges inherit. And this is nice. Uh, we will actually have a branch of our family down here. I wonder how that will go. Very excited to see it. Now, in the East, uh, I don't think we need to care about all that much, because we're looking basically just at Corsica, which is of course very important, but they're Bonifazi. So this will be family politics in a way. Um, oh yeah, by the way, Lotharinge, Bonifazi. Look at that. King Clotaire IV is a Bonifazi. Very, very interested in this Bonifazi family. They are the Dukes of Corsica, the Duke of Provence, the Duke of Toscana, and the Kings of Lotharingia. There is a big Bonifazi family here in this general area. Either way, um, I think that she is on the fence and should be on the fence because obviously he is just recently becoming the King of Italy. He would have to undertake some, you know, traveling right here to visit his vassals on Italy to assert his authority. And until that is done, I understand, of course, that Duchess Marguerite would be reserved towards him in particular because she does actually speak his native tongue and he decided to learn Czechoslovene for the Vieden Duchess uh, for the war lady Dujana right here. So, yeah, no, I understand why she is reserved. Then you have all of these city-states here. I don't think we need to worry about this too much. I don't think it plays too big of a role, but what does play a big role is Istria. Duke Matej, the monster of Istria. Look at him go. Slovene, Dual, Vulgar, High German, and Italian Vulgar. And he is insanely powerful. He stems from the Croatians. Um, I think we can find him in... Uh, Right here, yep, he stems from the Croatian dukes of the Domagojevic dynasty. And Ban Danael II is by far not the most powerful duke. He has changed culture, he's French. This is because, of course, King Gigi was, uh, was French, so he basically adopted the culture to play nice. I think he is yet another potential systemic threat, because the king in Carcassonne is far away from Italy. In the past, Italy was, of course, administered directly here, from the castle in Torino, that was the seat of King Gigi, but those days are over. We're now looking at a situation where I think the most likely situation that we will be facing here, since Denise can't actually rise up, she has this alliance with our king, is an independence revolt in Italy. And we might have to uh, quell that, we might have to move in there with our king. But that is definitely something for the future. For the moment, just keep in mind, we have in Toulouse Duke Jocelyn that our Elizabeth feels very, very hostile towards. And then, of course, we have everything going on here in Istria, Auvergne, and uh, uh, where, where were they? Uh, Aragon. Those are the folks, of course, that are systemic potential threats as well as Toscana. But to be fair, they are Bonifazi. That is family. If they rebelled, I would be very upset. But yeah, this is a volatile situation, but every crisis is a good opportunity. As strong as he is, there is a good chance that people might rise up against him, and if they do, if we strike them down, he will emerge ever more powerful. Um, yeah, this is the overview. We will now go on and actually play for maybe just 10 minutes, you know, to get this video to like 30 minutes. Very, very excited for all of this. I hope so are you. Now, for starters, what I want to do, let me just take a look at this. Duke Joslin, right? He is in a position where we know he is a kinslayer. The Pope can't be too happy about this. Oh, ha, 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 ha. And the Pope would grant us, very interesting, the Pope would grant us a claim on the Duchy of Toulouse. We could oust the Gelonis family right here, right now. We could actually take him down. Where are you in prison? Uh, you're in prison in Corsica. That is curious, okay. It must have been a campaign between these two. I. She's actually allied to Toulouse. One of her vassals has imprisoned... The, the wife of the Duke of Toulouse, Marguerite Bonifazi. She's a Bonifazi as well. Yeah, look at that. Wow. Those are some powerful claims. The Bonifazi family is a major driving force. We we got our family, of course. We got the Bonifazi family and we got the Gelonese family. 
Very, very impressive what they have done here in the Italian realm. But yeah, wow. Um, I think we have sought a lot of assistance from the Pope. If we were to do it again, if we were to seek more assistance, I think we could only do this after a pilgrimage. I don't feel comfortable with Duchess Elizabeth writing to the Pope right now. Obviously, she is very hostile towards Duke Joseline, but you know, it's not the first instinct. And I don't think it's the Pope's first instinct. I mean, he did kill his uh, his mother. Man, that is that is crazy. Oh, wait a minute. Count Jocelyn of Montpellier was killed. Oh, I'll... It, it's Pierre, of course. Bea's brother that killed Count Jocelyn. Wow, this, this rivalry goes so far back. Yeah, we... Okay, I want to do a pilgrimage, and then we're going to take a good look at whether we can't just go ahead and actually oust them. I can ask him for money here, but I'm not going to do that, at least for the moment. We could declare war on Carloman the Fourth. It's... Just for that. Yeah, this uh, this branch of our dynasty, actually, once she dies, will inherit a claim to France. Very, very powerful claim. We would have to see how that goes. Uh, anything else here? I don't think so. I think I'll just uh, start unpausing, and once we have enough money, we will go ahead and actually go on a pilgrimage. Oh, a curse undone. The twist and turns of fate have not always been to my advantage. God knows that I was cursed the day I met Yimeno. That was our court chaplain who turned rival because we condemned him. Today, however, that curse has been lifted. Fate has smiled upon me and brought that brooding churl to his grave. Not one day too soon. So, until now, we had a very, very difficult relationship. And he's Anglo-Saxon. We had a very, very difficult relationship with the church here. And we don't like Bishop Aitzik, but he is a willing participant in our schemes. He respects us. Rustrik does not respect us all that much. He was definitely would definitely argue against us, but to be fair, his level of power is barely existent at that point. It has, it has gone down. Quite a bit, I would say. Um, you know what? We might as well petition our liege. I actually checked this off camera. I did see, yeah, he could send bailiffs. And we have at least one province where we would need the bailiffs. You know what? I will request raising county control. We must be in charge of this realm, especially now with the size that it has taken. I'm escorted uh, into King Lopez's throne room, where he beckons for me to approach and address him. I carefully describe the problems my fiefdom faces, resistant to my authority and beset by vagabonds, and request assistance in restoring order. After listening to the speech, she smiles warmly at me and states, Absolutely, my, uh, my dear Elizabeth. I, I mean, we know each other well enough, that I don't think he just says vassal. I shall dispatch my agents immediately to take care of this matter. He spends 140 bucks. He spends stress. Wow. And I gain opinion of you. Actually, he gains opinion of me. Really. That can't be right. Um, all held counties with less than 66 control. The control level will change by plus 10. Then the royal bailiffs come in. Very, very nice. Um, and, of course, our dynasty actually gains renown. This is such a nice renown gain. Wow. Very, very nice. Um, right. So this now concerns... We are improving it somewhere here. Yeah, we are. It only concerns Zanduina, which we just conquered. But, of course, you know, this is basically, I think, the king saying, you know what, Zanduina, you can take it. I, I think the church had it for long enough. Ooh, and our child actually returned, and we are under attack here. I think we need to defend that for sure, but he returned. Um, did he make any friends? He does have a friend. It's Lope, Michipsa's son, who was brought up by Slavga, right? Very, very cool. Okay, so they are friends. Um, if Felipe takes over, which he, of course, will right now, standing, unless anything bad happens, he will definitely give Lope a good position, maybe even a title. The two respect one another. Quite a bit, I would say. Um, now, you are at war. I have to assume, yeah, it's a rebellion. Okay. Um, this is a liberty war. So, not actually a war that is too vital, but... Ah, Vieden, huh? I will gladly take this war. Vieden has slain, I believe, my brother, if I'm not mistaken. My brother, Gomez. And I will not forget it. This war was too much. And there you go. I, I will go to war against them, absolutely. Let's go into the breach once more. Oh, and I... Uh, every time, I keep forgetting this. And whenever you just click it away, for some reason, it actually just, like, puts it away. So, yeah. No, I'm, I'm obviously going to join this war. My husband, I am on my way. Let's get this done. Hmm, what do we have here? Kind word. My paths happen to have crossed with Earl Habert, or Herbert. And to my surprise, it seems as though he does not have a great impression of my friend, Duke Vea. Perhaps I should take this opportunity to change his mind. Right. Um, I could make things worse. Wow, and that's actually the majority chance here. Um, I am a person that is honest. Listen, I just speak my mind. And when Earl Her Herbert comes in and says Duke Vea II is absolutely a terrible person, I would obviously say that can't be true. Let me tell you a story about how Vea once, you know, saved a maid from bandits. 
Take a look at this. Enemy alliance, right? The uh, Dujana has joined. I have joined the war as well. We got a new bishop. The rest doesn't really matter for us. Changes of conviction. I tried to paint Duke Vea in the best possible light and Earl Herbert gradually started listening with greater and greater interest. When he muttered, I never knew that to himself. I knew I have made an impre uh, impression. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. We did well for our dear nephew there. And yeah, this is a devastating battle. I can only hope that he's not actually commanding this himself. Um... No, okay, it is it is not himself. This is actually also kind of heartbreaking. This fella is an ally of the person that is rebelling, ultimately making it so that he now is currently fighting and losing a battle against his ally. Um, Divine Judgment. I have a diplomacy perk available, okay. My Bishop 8 Sieg is really getting on my nerves. Not a moment goes by when he isn't joining on and on about God and his will. He especially loves to tell everyone how the Lord will punish harlots and fornicators. But why would I listen to him when the haunt guard embrace, embraces us as we are, flaws and all? What a sad little life Aetzig must live. Hmm, I will make him the laughing stock of Bayona. So, yet again, we are having trouble with the church. And this time it's very, very personal trouble. I mean, we were rival with our previous bishop, but that stemmed from us agitating against him. In this case, we basically just do not like Aetzig as a person. Uh, acting like a pious little pansy will shut him up. Um, so I could just play along. But I do definitely think, I think we're just going to tell him what's up. Oh, wait. He won't know what, uh, what to believe in when I'm done with him. Right, so I could, I basically turn him into a non-believer. Wow. Um, you may choose to give up or keep trying and then nothing happens. Yeah, okay, no, I'll, I'll tell him. Listen, buddy, we do things differently in this region. We respect the church. We respect Jesus Christ. But don't you ever disrespect our dear Archibalds. Um Now, will we actually get this battle here? Let's take a look. Hidden in the secret passage behind 86 chamber, I gleefully listen to the vile man's groans and sighs. He has read the tome I left on his bed. In fact, he has been unable to put it down. The truths within seem to have had a significant impact on his faith. Oh God, I need a sign. I have believed in you, exerted your will on earth, but now all I can see are the contradictions, the fallacies, the lies. Aetzig's voice shatters to incoherent sobs. I now know of his secret as a non-believer. Wow. Um... I don't think I will blackmail him, actually. I think this is the most fascinating approach that we can take for the church. Bishop Aetzig, right? I almost was tempted to say maybe we won't, you know, request a hook from the... Not a hook, a claim from the Pope. But now that Bishop Aetzig would vouch for us, no matter what, because of what we know about him... Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting indeed. Because surely a letter from our Archbishop, well, our Bishop, I should say, towards the Pope would make it so that the Pope would be convinced that Tolosa, uh, Tolosa should be in our hands. I think we will use this as a great, great opportunity here. And I'm looking at this. We're not going to catch you here, are we? Um, and I don't even think... Oh, I could catch you here. I don't think we would be losing this. I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I don't think, even if it's in the mountains, I don't think we're losing this. And I think we need to engage them separately. Oh, and I forgot about this perk, actually. Um, we're going to pick up confidence. Each friend, or confidence, each friend adds a minus 5% stress gain. Very, very nice. I love to see it. I will engage in this battle. And let's hope, I mean, this can't possibly be a loss. Yeah, the, the negatives here are <laughs> tremendous, but we are winning. And I just got another point here. Oh, no. One of our counselors died. Who, who was it? Obeko was slain. Man. Okay, this was a, a terrible, like, difficult battle. But my god, my people die like flies in Veden. And here's a pregnancy, yet another one. Very nice. While we are serving here. Well, while, while we're serving our, uh, our husband, I guess. So at this point, we're basically looking at a situation where um, we are rightfully, of course, campaigning with him. Um, now, we have ousted him. And we're looking at... Oh, wow. <laughs> this was revenge. You know what? I'll take... Oh, no, Michipsa. Please. Severely injured Michipsa. No, you can't do this to me. We, we do have one, right? We have a cold physician. We do. You need to heal him. He hasn't gotten treatment yet. This, I... Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> I regret this. I enjoy this immensely. So, and, and by the way, the way battle losses happen here, they are always so intense. We have so many people that we lose in battles. I will not commonly remove people from knights, or, you know, from the knight role, even if it puts them at risk, especially if we are a brave character. I think Duchess Elizabeth expects it from the people around her to serve in war. It is their duty and their privilege. And I killed the husband of Duchess Veden, the wicked. Wonderful. I, I enjoy that greatly. I, I certainly do. Um, now, we do need a new spymaster. 
Hmm. And Chip says, isn't he a pretty good... Oh, he's a terrible spy. Okay, no, he's not. There's no shot. I would like to recruit somebody that I trust. Mayor Tibalt. Not great at it, but I do trust him. I do trust Eneko. Eneko Ladro de Guevara is a very good fella. Uh, I think he, he also enjoys me. And Count Pierre. Right, his father died and... I mean, he's not great at it. Yeah, no, you should definitely stay here. I'm just going to put Tibalt in. There you go. I, I can barely trust you. Good enough. I, I think we'll immediately challenge them to a second fight here. Where are they retreating, I wonder? I, I don't think we can tell. A secret exposed. A secret truth has reached the light of day. My vassal may be a hazard and affair. Yeah, I don't... You know, I don't really care. Hmm. Fornicator? Hunchbacked? She is pregnant. With Guichard de Vernon's child, huh? Ah. We are in good standing with the church, but that good standing stems from the fact, at least canonically speaking, that I have blackmail material at our bishop. So I think I'm just gonna let this one go. It puts us towards faithful, uh, actually, it puts us one lower be below this, towards dutiful. You know what? Sure. They're not but malice and lies. I don't think that she is a big fan of fornication or anything like this, but I don't think she minds as much as the church does. So, usually I would never take that hit to the level of devotion because uh, devotion is so difficult to come by, but, you know, this, this time around, sure. Oh, and he went back, you fool! We caught him, I think. Let's see. Okay, you know what? Let's maybe not challenge them there. We are in a pretty good spot now, though, at least. We wore them down. All we need is a peace deal. Uh, who's in my... Who are you? Goraged. Hmm. No, that's okay. Okay. Okay, I'm not enjoying that. Uh, let me just take a quick look at this. Right. I'm pregnant. He's commanding it now. And he's winning. Oh my god. It's so... No, what are you doing? My husband. Oh my... Okay, you know, it's just the AI. And he killed somebody. And he's brutally mauled. Mitch Seepsa. I... This is a rough campaign. This is a very rough campaign. And somebody learned about 8 Sieg's uh, secret as a non-believer. That's unlucky, but... Mitschiebser. Mitschiebser, Mitschiebser. Where are you? I beg you, Mitschiebser. He served in my armies. He did as good as he could. And he was mistreated. You gotta be kidding. Ah, oh, that is depressing. That That is that is just depressing. Any day now, you will get the message that Michipsa has passed away. There it is. Oh, Michipsa. Slavka, you will always be welcome here. Michipsa's child, I, I, will, I will bring him up myself. Martin. Your brother's death is terrible. It really, really is. I, I honestly, I, I have to take myself back here now. Because I think I had a stronger connection to Michipsa than Duchess Elizabeth had. The both of them respected one another, I think. She respects that he died, but they weren't emotionally close. As much as I think I have connected to Michipsa, I don't think she has. So in that sense, yeah. That's rough. <laughs> that, that, is, that is extraordinarily rough. My god. We do have a new daughter here, Elizabeth, definitely, uh, except that we should name her after myself. Do we have a siege general? We do not. Or a siege commander, I should say, so I'm just gonna put that aside. Let's finish this siege and win this war, and then I'm gonna actually end this episode. Servant of Honesty, I was shocked when I caught Martin trying to steal from the travel chest of the visiting Mayor Garcia. He confessed he had thought he could get away with it, but now knows it was wrong. Martin, yeah, grow up to be honest. It's good. Understanding, to be honest, is good. And this puts us at 61. We got some good money out of this. I could challenge them there, but I think we should honestly just keep sieging. Like, they, they can't siege fast enough because I have the siege equipment and such. They do not have as much. Uh, making acquaintances. Felipe seemed to enjoy our latest feast immensely. He got along quite well with everyone he spoke to, even the adult guests. You know what? Wait a minute. I would like to take a look at this. It's cheap, sir. I, I, we injured so many of their knights. This was a... Say what you will, but this was a good battle. If you... If you really look at the details here, it's just... Ah, Mitschipsa. What a shame. And he's gregarious, so I don't think that she has anything against it at all. 
it never hurts to make friends. She she definitely she builds upon friends. I mean, this is just yet again, this option is written from her point of view, it feels like. Because yeah, that's exactly how she feels. She thinks friends are some of the most important things in life. Alright, so now that the war is basically over, let me just take a look at this. You can ransom Gorasht Jemodre. He is the second born of Duchess Dujana the Pious. Huh. I could ransom him. I could also execute him. Execute by hanging, huh? I don't think he did anything wrong. He didn't slay Machipsa. He didn't, you know, slay anybody that uh, was really vital to the operation. Let me just take a look at this. I, I need to... I'm not sure who wounded him actually anymore. I need to go back in the footage there. I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna... Do it. I'm not gonna execute him. I, I, I think that would be me as a player making that decision. I don't, I don't think Elizabeth would take that decision. He'll be in prison for the moment. Man, I... <laughs> dealing with that death. That is, that was devastating, let me tell you. Uh, we have a new uh, Chancellor right here, I think that is fine. Let's just get the peace deal and then... Boom. All of a sudden he holds all of this land. I think he can revoke this if he hasn't already. Um, oh, there it is, Provence, right? We'll see how that goes either way. This is a success. I think in the next episode, we will be taking a look at the Jalonis family. We are a very good commander, and despite all the losses, I think it is fair to say that she hasn't had a PTSD moment as the people, you know, the uh, characters in f uh, before her had it. She sees the loss of Machipsa as an honorable death, as a death that occurred because he was as brave as he was. Which is why she's now bringing up his primary son herself. We might very well give him a title at some point. We'll see. This is it for this episode. I hope that you enjoyed this. It was a wild ride, despite, of course, the very, very long exposition. I'll see you later. Alligator.